relationship between the mind and the brain is, is undeniable, right? I mean, if you have ever gotten drunk in your life, you know that there is such a relationship. If you add a chemical substance to your brain, your state of mind, your conscious state uh, changes. Um, if you get knocked off, physically hit in the head, you may also pass out or have some other kind of brain state uh, or mind state uh, as a consequence of being knocked off or anesthesia. Um, the examples are endless. Uh, scientists put people in brain scanners, fMRI scanners, and they find these tight correlations between states of consciousness, in other words, what you experience subjectively, and brain states, which can be measured by the functional MRI tool that takes pictures of your brain while it's active. Now, from that, most people, even scientists, conclude that the brain generates the mind, that the brain causes the mind. But that is not necessarily so. All that we have observed is a correlation, not a causation. Let me give you an example. Um, every time you see a big fire, there are lots of firefighters, right? And every time you see a small fire, there are many less firefighters. So there is a correlation. Do you conclude from this that firefighters cause the fire? You don't. They happen together, but one doesn't cause the other. So the, the possibility that is open to us is, although there are clear correlations between mind states and brain states, does that necessarily mean that the brain causes the mind? Or is there another possibility here? So the reason we look for a, a different explanation for these correlations between conscious states or mind states on the one, one, the one hand and brain states on the other hand is that they are not always correlated. There are situations where mind states completely depart from brain states, where the brain goes to sleep while people are having the experiences of their lives, unfathomable experiences. And in fact, historically, the techniques for what I call subjective exploration, for, for developing a relationship with reality based on your own personal experience, all of these techniques are based on, the, on, on reducing brain activity, on reducing brain chatter that's chattered, com constantly plays out uh, in your brain. For instance, meditation does that explicitly. Um, there are techniques of yoga, or holotropic breath work which use hyperventilation and the effect is to increase the alkalinity in your blood which constricts blood vessels in your brain, reduce blood flow to the brain and reduce brain activity and through that people achieve mystical experiences or experiences comparable to psychedelic trances. Um, Near-death experiences are the most extreme example where there is no blood flow at all anywhere in the body, certainly not in the brain and there is no brain activity, and yet people report meeting the Godhead, meeting dead relatives, having amazing, uh, coherent, complex experiences that in principle would require uh, fully working your cortex and maybe, maybe even more. And even psychedelic trances, which historically people have assumed to be caused by uh, the drug increasing brain activity in areas of the brain and therefore generating the so-called hallucinations. Recently in a study that came out in 2012, a uh, study done in the UK uh, by a team led by Professor uh, David Nutt, uh, they have shown that for instance psilocybin, the active ingredient of, uh, of uh, psychedelic mushrooms, uh, works in fact by significantly reducing brain activity. There is no increase anywhere in the brain a very carefully conducted study where volunteers were injected with psilocybin while inside an fMRI scanner, so there is very little room for, for doubt. So what is happening here? If the brain generated the mind, how come people are having the most intense, complex, memorable experiences of their lives while your brain activity is reduced or even eliminated altogether? So, yeah, that, that, that doesn't really explain things to say that the brain generates the mind. We need an alternative model, an alternative way to look at that relationship.
So imagine that consciousness, mind, is not generated by the brain. Imagine that consciousness is fundamental, that it is there a priori, in, in any case. And imagine that consciousness is coupled to the brain in such a way that brain states modulate conscious experience. In other words, if consciousness is unbound, then what the brain does is localizes it in a space-time location and filters out from the sea of potential experiences everything that is not correlated to that space-time location. There would be evolutionary reasons for the brain to do that, so we would identify our attention, our awareness with the location of the physical body and therefore allow better for its survival. Um, if that is the case, the correlations ordinarily observed between conscious states and brain states is fully explained because the brain modulates your conscious experience. So if you interfere with the brain, you interfere with that modulation process or that filtering process if you wish. And therefore your experience of the world changes, right? At the same time, it would also explain why people can have peak experiences when brain activity is low or zero, because then the localization mechanism, the filtering mechanism, is taken out of the picture, and consciousness then declenches, relaxes, delocalizes, and experience would then only increase, because you are no longer uh, arrested, if you, you are no longer bound to a space-time location. Your experiences are no longer being so actively filtered out for evolutionary reasons as ordinarily happens. Now, the problem with this is that uh, people who know my work know that I, I hold this philosophical position that uh, everything is consciousness, that all reality is a ripple in, in the ocean of consciousness. There is no world outside of consciousness, which is the particular myth under which we, we live today according to the current scientific paradigm. But then, if that is the case, and it is also the case that the brain is a localization mechanism of consciousness, a filter of consciousness, if you will, then the brain is itself a ripple in the ocean of consciousness. So how can consciousness or mind localize itself, filter itself? A coffee filter is not made of coffee, right? How can a consciousness filter be made of consciousness and be nothing but consciousness? How do we make sense of this? You can only do that through metaphors. One metaphor is that the brain is a kind of knot of consciousness, but I, I, I will use another metaphor now. Uh, picture a, a, a stream of water, a little stream, and, and a whirlpool in that stream, a little whirlpool of turning water in the stream. Now, if that stream is a metaphor for consciousness, then the whirlpool is a way in which consciousness localizes itself, right? The molecules of water go down the stream, get captured in the whirlpool, and then stay in the whirlpool, circling around for a while before they're finally released and go on their way. So, the whirlpool, although being something that you can define very well, you can delineate its borders, you can point at it and say, there is a whirlpool. There is nothing to the whirlpool but water itself. It's just water taking a certain pattern, a certain, certain pattern of movement that uh, localizes it, that filters itself. Since the molecules of water in it get trapped in it, it's a kind of filtering out. It's a localization mechanism. Perhaps the brain is like a whirlpool of consciousness. You can point at the brain and say, there is a brain. And yet, for all you know, it's just a ripple in the ocean of consciousness localizing itself, filtering it in itself, so we can have the kind of experiences that we have. What happens when we die? That is the ultimate question, right? Um, I, I wish I really knew the answer, but we, we can follow from, from this philosophy and try to extrapolate and extract some conclusions. If 
the brain is indeed a localization mechanism for consciousness, a filter of consciousness, if you will, then what is physical death? It's the decomposition of the brain. It's the brain not being able to do its job anymore. From that perspective, physical death is the ultimate liberation, the ultimate relaxation, the clenching, the localization of consciousness that should just enrich experience. Perhaps there are other meta-localization mechanisms of consciousness in other levels of reality uh, which we go to after physical death. Maybe it's not the ultimate expansion in the ocean of consciousness, but from the, from the perspective of what we know in this level of reality at least, uh, it is certainly a liberation if these hypotheses are true.